ECE 8813 wireless without battery special topics class this is lecture 19 I believe and the topic today will be <coughs> some applications of some of the things that we've talked about two in particular localization and um, some tamper detection. But first I thought I'd just run through and review a few things by asking a few questions. This is in lieu of having a homework number six. We won't have a homework number six. We only put five on the, uh, the syllabus, so I, I won't bother assigning it. This is our last lecture class. We have a test coming up. Test one on Monday, the 27th of March. And for DL students, that means your window for taking it will start on Monday and will extend through to April the 3rd. which is the following Monday. Your project, my last day in Shenzhen will be next Wednesday, one week from today. Actually, I'll be on a plane this time next Wednesday, all things, if all things go well. The project will be on, collected on the 24th of April. And that will be for everyone, in-class students and DL students. There's so much ahead of, so much advance notice given to the state that there's no need to have a window, like there is with small homework assignment assignments. <clears throat> and that's it. That's all you have to worry about. Any questions on the administrative aspects of the class? Okay, let's do a review question. Sid asked me just now, so what kind of questions could you ask about, about balance coding? That's a good question, Sid. I got an example of an old test question that in involves some balance coding. <clears throat> so it says, below are four candidate pulses for use in a binary modulation scheme that must contend with a typical orange no noise characteristic uh, of a backscatter system where the power spectral density of the noise, some of it will be filtered out at low frequencies. The characteristic is N naught one plus F sub B absolute value of F. So if we graph that in the frequency domain, let's do both sides of the frequency domain, positive and negative. We have a power spectral density that's essentially flat with a value of N naught at very extreme values of frequency. And then somewhere near the breakpoint F sub B and minus F sub B, this ramps up. So let's answer the questions based on this scenario. Question A goes like this. It said, in the noise PSD, power spectral density, what frequency is the contribution of power from white noise processes the same as the power for, from colored noise processes? Well, that's an easy one. That's actually the very definition of the, the break frequency. The white noise portion, portion let's call this SNW, that's equal to N naught. 
Of course, and not has units of watts per hertz. So watts over one over watts over one over seconds, or watt seconds, or joules actually. But I think it makes more sense to call it watts per hertz because that kind of brings to mind what it is. Is a power that tells you how the power is spread out in frequency. And then there's a, the colored part of the noise is the second part of this term over here where that's equal to n naught f over f, fb over f. So what point are those contributions equal n naught is equal to n naught fb over f? And not to cancel, we find that F, the equal point is either at plus or minus FB. A little semantics there, just the definition of our noises. Okay, it says a receiver demodulates these pulses by first running the signal and noise through an ideal bandpass filter with a low cutoff frequency of FB and a high cutoff frequency of 2FB. How much noise power is on the output of the bandpass filter in terms of n naught and f sub b? So you understand that what that question is asking? It says, okay, here's the noise. Yeah, I'm going to have some sort of uh, signal power spectral density. Hopefully it's balanced. So it's going to be like this. And then hopefully it's better than that. Something like this. And then I have an ideal bandpass filter. What does that look like? Ideally, it's a uh, filter has unit of uh, unit value one. The low cutoff frequency C is F sub B, two F sub B, and of course this same on the other side as well. So then, if I have a process that's described by a power spectral density, that means it's a wide sense stationary noise process and it goes through this ideal bandpass filter how do I calculate power on the other side of that? The ideal bandpass filters only lets through frequencies between FB and 2FB and remember that my power spectral density is in units of watts per hertz so all I have to do is integrate my power spectral density from F sub B to 2 F B here and of course on the negative side too or it's symmetrical so I can just yeah I don't need to do all that integration twice right I just put a 2 in front of everything you're right so my output power of noise should be the integral of F B to 2 F B n not 1 over f sub b. I'm not going to use the absolute value because I'm only on the positive side of the, the plane. I'm going to just double what I get on the positive side. Otherwise, I would have to integrate from negative 2 fb to negative fb, put a term like that on, on the right there, and then negate the term in there, and then have that all work out. It's just easier to use symmetry and then keep everything positive <coughs> instead of keeping the absolute value sign. So, okay, so this is actually two integrals. This is the integral of the constant n naught from FB to 2FB. Well, that's really easy. That's just two times the difference between the integration points, which is just FB. And then the next thing we have to do, we have a similar set of constants. So let me just put one plus the integral I heard somebody do it in their head really quickly. That was excellent. I'll do it long way so I don't skip steps. Integral of 1 over f is the log of f, and that's evaluated from 2fb as the top limit. This is the bottom. That's going to be log 2fb minus log fb. Or because it's a logarithm, you can just divide the limits. Log of 2fb over fb. fbs cancel, and I get log 2. So this is my final answer.
and it should have units of watts if everything worked out right. This is a watt per hertz. FB is in hertz. So that's signal power. Unit analysis can save you on a test, saves you lots of points if you can do it correctly. And then finally, the third question here is, which of the above signaling pairs, A through D, would make the best set of pulses for backscatter modulation given a typical direct down conversion receiver? Why, it asks. And so let me faithfully reproduce with computer-like accuracy the four combination of pulses that are described in here. We have one that looks like this. And this is labeled as a one. And the bottom row is going to contain the zeros. So let's see, this is this is problem C, but we'll call this option A. Option B. So these are all basically four coded symbols per bit. We have a bunch of time domain sketches. Four sets of pulses. One, the top one represents the one, the bottom one represents the zero. So you'd flip back and forth between these different types of pulses to send your ones and zeros. And these all have to, you have to pick one that would best transmit through this type of channel here, this orange noise channel. So can you figure that out just by looking at it? Which set of pulses, which combination would make the best pulse? A, B, C, or D? Sorry, I couldn't get them all on the same screen. Don't all answer at once. Well, what am I looking for? What's the desirable characteristic of these pulses, of both pulses that I should use to send data? More number of bits per data bit. That's right. So I, I, I would like to minimize the number of transmitted bits versus the number of actual data bits. Basically re increase the coding rate of the system. However, I've kind of made an apples to apples comparison here. All the schemes I've shown here are basically four binary bits of coded bits per transmitted data bits. Each of these is a one and a zero. I've got four pairs and each of them has basically four bits. If I, it's kind of hard to see because I drew it by hand here, but each one should be four bits across. So if we don't have control over the throughput or the coding rate, if we just have these to select from, what is it we should be looking for?
but we want to minimize the DC content of the spectrum, right? We want to get rid of this, any data at zero frequencies. And there's only one pair here that actually does that. Can you see which one? B, you're right. B for balance. How is this a balance code? Well, look, this is the only one where both the one and the zero has the same number of ones, highs at states as low states. So we know that since every single coded word is balanced, and if, if I prime this, it, well, it doesn't even matter if I prime it with uh, random ones and zeros. No matter what I do, this signal will not have, no matter what data I send, this signal will not have DC content at zero. I can't say that about any of the other, uh, uh, other signals. And you can understand why that is, right? Because if I look at, let's say, I have a string of ones, and I'm using set A. So that means that I send two highs, a low, and then another high as my one. And if that persists across many data bits, then what happens is that now I have a signal that has DC content, right? Is it one, 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 one. It's not a flat line, but there's still much more high than low. So when it goes through a backscatter receiver, one of two things is gonna happen. If you make the cutoff too high for the high pass filter at the end of that thing, then when I detect this, this is going to start to angle down. That top line is going to angle down and it's going to distort where my decision boundaries should be. Or if I lower that cutoff frequency and allow more of the, the low frequency content of my signal through, then I'm going to get 1 over F noise or 1 over F to the power of something noise. These, these low frequency noise processes that are in every single electronics. Um, they start to plague and, and come in and that causes these low frequency surges like the, like the ocean pretty much to ride on top of your signal and again distort where the decision, decision threshold should be. If I transmitted the pair B symbols, then that wouldn't matter. As long as any undulation, slow varying undulation from noise or any cutoff filter that was reasonable with a, a band with a reasonable high pass cutoff would not distort those decision boundaries. Yeah. So if we had like one is a balance code, mm -hmm. and what if we had another situation where we had more number of data bits being sent compared to the data bits? Uh, we had a higher data, so which we'll, we'll select? We'll select the balance one, or we'll select the one which has more bits per data bit. So that that would depend on your system. You'd need to know a little bit on more about your system. That's right. So the thing about this, there's a trade-off, right? I send words that are this long, regardless of how many coded bits constitute them, right? Um, and that means that I'm gonna have a frequency spectrum. Now, there's a trade-off here. The higher the code rate, the closer to one to one you get, then the more data you're set sending. However, that pushes that cutoff frequency down some such that the only way once you get past a certain point the only way to make it work through a channel if the power spectral density of your balance code still doesn't cut off before you start to accumulate all this noise or filtering then you need to speed things up and if you can't speed things up what that really means is you just have to back off on the code rate so that's the trade-off in designing these systems
Okay. Any other questions? Well, I have other questions. Let's try another one. Oh, here's a simple one. List five different types of magnetic materials, ordering them from highest, from lowest to highest DC. And that reminds me, on the, the T-Square site, I've updated your readings finally. We, uh, we had lecture 17, recall that, that was saw devices. I put a nice overview article um, from the IEEE on that. For 18, that was magnetic materials. And actually, it was an electronic article surveillance. I couldn't find a really good article on electronic article surveillance that talked about the things that we talked about in that lecture. So uh, I gave you some notes on magnetic materials instead. It's good to be familiar with that. It's uh, very unfortunate that we don't teach enough of that magnetic materials to electrical engineers. We should, maybe we should just go all in and call you magnetic engineers instead, right? Because to the physicists, it's all the same, right? E and H, you can't have one without the other. Under a relativistic change, you can change an electric field into a magnetic field and vice versa, depending on what frame of reference you're in. That's why there are four fundamental forces, the strong force, the weak force, gravity, and electromagnetism. Electricity and magnetism are not two separate forces. But for some reason, we prefer the electrical field in everything that we do. Magnetism scares us. And so as a joke, I always used to tell students back in Atlanta, I said, there are three things that, three questions, really simple questions that you can ask your electrical engineering professor and it will scare them or stump them. One is, how does a battery work? How does a magnet work? And how do women work? <laughs> anyway, that's... And if you're a female, you can substitute how do men work, right? That's the, it's a generic joke. Not meant to be sexist. Okay, list five magnetic materials. I have my answer sheet here. Uh, here we go. What was the weakest one we covered? Oh, wait, I forgot to put my uh, last set of readings. I did upload two more documents too, sort of an A and a B. One is the Petwari paper that talk, talks about localizing low-powered wireless networks, nodes in low-powered wireless networks. And then um, the Morris paper. It's a neat way to use backscatter for tamper detection. I'll talk about those after we, we do our problems here. Magnetic materials question. Okay. The weakest was diamagnetism. The next weakest was paramagnetism. Yes. Fairy is next. Fairy magnetism. One we didn't talk about actually this time around, super paramagnetism. That's basically a nanoparticle type of magnetism where you take little nanometer scale spheres of particles, grind them up and put them in a, uh, a polymer or something like that. So you kind of get some a little bit of ferromagnetic cooperation. 
So you get high, high MISA bar, but you don't get some of the bad things that happens with ferromagnetism, like permanent uh, magnetic moments. Not that that's bad, but there, there are sometimes that's good, and there's sometimes that's bad. And then ferromagnetism is the strong one. And there, this is not a complete list. There's also <coughs> anti ferry magnetism, anti ferro magnetism. There's a, a thousand different types of magnetic materials. But these are some of the most important ones to engineers. Okay, and uh, here's another question. Here's a saw device question. A surface acoustic wave device temperature sensor has an acoustic velocity of propagation of V sub P of 3,300 3, meters per second. The linear coefficient of expansion for the saw material is 5 times 10 to the negative fifths per Kelvin. And I have here as a parenthetical, just to help you along with the understanding, i.e. the length of a material will expand by 0.005% for every degree Kelvin of temperature increase. This is by no means a linear phenomenon, but generally speaking, you can use a constant coefficient for small temperature displacement. So if presuming this is measured at room temperature or something near the temperature of operation, we can basically say that if I have a saw tag of length L. And I apply a temperature difference delta T. Then this guy here, we'll call him uh, gamma. Gamma times L times delta T equals your delta L. Okay, if the saw device is one centimeter, so L is equal to 0 0.01 meters, I always like to immediately convert to the SI units to avoid any possible confusion later on in my problem. If the saw device is one centimeter in total length and the saw reader can resolve changes in delays from tags of at least 0.1 nanoseconds. So that means delta T is one times 10 to the negative 10 seconds. I can resolve things within that level of delta T. Then what is the minimum resolution of the temperature sensor in Kelvin? So let's see. I have a tag that's one centimeter long, and it's going to change in length. So let's say I put a transducer on one side of the tag. The surface acoustic wave gets propagated down. Then I have a reflector bar somewhere, one or two or more reflector bars at the other end of the tag, one centimeter away. The surface acoustic wave is going to travel down, hit these guys, and come back. What is the total amount of time that I can travel on there? I'm going delta L down. I'm also going delta L back, right? So the total distance I travel is actually 2 delta L. 2 delta L. And if I wanted to translate that into a time difference, actually, it's it's 2L, but the difference in time is going to be delta T times 2 delta L divided by what? The velocity of propagation. That's our, what we called, 3,300 3, meters per second. And delta L is equal to we said gamma, coefficient of expansion, times L, times delta T,
So where's our unknown? Our unknown is delta t. This is our resolution. So solving for that, we say delta t, velocity of propagation, divided by 2 gamma l. If we plug all these numbers in, we know everything on this side. So this is 0.1 nanoseconds. We know velocity of propagation of the surface acoustic wave material. We said this was 0.005%, the coefficient of friction. This guy over here we said was one centimeter. We know all of that. So if we plug it into the magic professor calculator where everything is calculated ahead of time, we get 0 0.3 Kelvin. So with this receiver that has very realistic numbers and a very realistic surface acoustic wave material and dimension and everything, what this says is that if I had a little tag and I put it on a piece of machinery, <clears throat> and there's countless examples of this. Let's say, for example, you were making a wind turbine, or not a turbine, uh, not a wind turbine, uh, a, a jet turbine of some sort. And you wanted to monitor the temperature of the blades inside. Oh my goodness, that's hard. The blades are spinning. Very high temperatures. So you can't really put conventional electronics on there anyway. But you could put one of these things because they can survive in tremendously high temperatures. And you can illuminate that with a radio, look at the, the response, and figure out down to 0.3 Kelvin, which is probably way overkill for a jet turbine engine. But there are other things that you can monitor this way as well. And this is a remote monitor make this measure from 100 meters away if you wanted to. Because this is, a, remember, you can send your wave wirelessly at a distance, look at the reflection coming back. And because surface acoustic wave tags delay their response so much more than the typical propagation environment where everything's uh, traveling at the speed of light, you can still pick out signals that are up to 100 meters away with this technique. Anything that has a temperature sensitive sensitivity, you can monitor a field of them. You can even do multiple access where different tags are encoded coded with different reflector bars. So you can de-embed them one from the other. There's outfits that there are tags you could buy like that that work that, that way. So one, one, uh, one of my friends in the power business, his name is Joe Rostrom, he's always giving me applications in the power, in the field of power and substation equipment. So one, one common area of fault in a power equipment, for example, is, are these things called, uh, I forget what they're called. They're, they're basically the equivalent of a, of a nonlinear fuse, um, maybe a lightning arrestor or something like that. They basically have, are looked very, very high impedance. They're connected to a high voltage line and to the ground. And they basically maintain a very high impedance unless the voltage goes beyond a certain threshold, in which case they short down to ground. So they siphon off a lot of extra current. If there happens to be something like a lightning strike or a power surge, it's beyond a certain threshold. And so these things are great devices. You just put them in substations. You forget about them for 10 years. But every once in a while, they fail and explode, sometimes take out a lot more expensive equipment with them, possibly make a safety hazard. YouTube exploding substations on the internet sometimes. You'll find all sorts of really fun videos, uh, you know, where million dollars, millions of dollars of equipment blows up. And so, you know, one of the things you'd like to be able to do is monitor a field of these uh, and look at their real time temperature. Because a month before they fail, they start leaking current and warming up a little bit. There are a lot of things that actually fail that way start warming up periodically or permanently, just slightly, then more, then more, then eventually they hit some sort of threshold and the, the whole thing goes. So there's a nice example of a surface acoustic wave problem I could ask.
Okay. Well, we're at the break time already. So let's just take a brief pause here, 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll come back. Okay, so the two papers that I put online, the one by Petwari and the one by Morris, are both applications of low-powered um, radio communications, low or no-powered radio communications that I wanted to cover before the end of the semester just because there were interesting applications to many of the th and you can think of a million other ones but I thought these were nicely um, nicely done so I will review them very briefly here I'll leave it to you to actually read the articles since we only have about 45 minutes of lecture left 40 minutes of lecture so to start I'll start with the Petwari le lecture and this relates to uh, node localization in a low power wireless network. And it's related to another thing that, that te Professor Patwari works on. He's at the University of Utah, which is tomography. And I'll explain the, the difference between the problems in a second. But first, we have a bunch of nodes, right? And all the way to node N. And these various nodes, can, if you're using a, a standard protocol that's low energy, so for example, like an, uh, a Zigbee protocol. Zigbee protocol, you may have heard of that. That's used for 2.4 gigahertz wireless networking. And it's really just sort of a, uh, a version of the 802.11b Wi-Fi standard in which they've ripped out a lot of the stuff that consumes power. Um, it was developed. Um, it was developed by an industry consortium, but a lot of it came out of work that was done at Motorola Labs uh, 15 years ago by some people that were working on something called neurophones, little RF neurons, the, the, using the analogy of a neuron where you fire messages through a network of neurons. Here you'd have a bunch of wireless network uh, sensor nodes that communicate with each other, can pass messages along the wireless network. And you know the question is, how do you localize nodes in this environment? Because what you can often do, if you are trying to track things in this low energy wireless world, like hooking sensors to objects to do inventory on computers, for example, at an office, um, or track pieces of equipment, then you have a bunch of anchor nodes that are fixed in your infrastructure and you know where they are. So let's circle a couple of anchor nodes in this network. Maybe this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And then you have maybe another node, other nodes that are free to move in wherever in the space that they want. Well, how do you track that? How do you how do you decide that? So we, there are a lot of different radio location schemes. In fact, you, there's an uncountable number, practically. You are kind of limited, though, in these low-powered sensor networks because the nodes are so simple. They don't do much. They can't really measure time of arrival really easily. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't have any antenna arrays. They're too small to have an array. They just have a tiny little antenna, and they broadcast and receive from any direction that they want. So your options are very limited. So for example, in the satellite communications class today, we're, we're doing, we did GPS, and that's a time difference of arrival. You basically 
looking at how when signals that were synchronized when they started to be broadcast by a satellite, in this case a GPS satellite, when did they arrive at the receiver? What is the relative time delay between the two? So if you know where the satellites are exactly in space and you look at that difference of arrival, then you can calculate your position. Um, so that's one way. Another way that people are looking at nowadays with varying degrees of success is to look at time of flight. And the reason you can do that, and it, 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 this is again a kind of a dicey um, proposition, is that you would like to have a true time of flight measurement where you send a signal and then that signal immediately reflects back. Well, it turns out with backscatter, you can't actually do that. But if you're just talking about regular Zigbee nodes or Bluetooth low energy nodes, or Dash 7 nodes, or whatever, whatever little technology you found to do this low powered communications, there's always some overhead, right? You have to detect the signal as it comes in. You have to perform some computational uh, operations, some of it, some of which may vary in size or in length and time. And then of course the absolute time that it takes to process and then send some sort of acknowledgement back, not only does that vary in from device to device, uh, from different types of devices to different types of devices, but even identical devices will have some variation because their oscillators aren't always the same, they're clocking at different rates. And, and so at the end of the day, there's a lot of variability with a time of flight measurement. If you, even if you can measure the time of flight very precisely, it's usually the node that's accepting a packet and then relaying a packet that makes it difficult to pin down exactly how far a signal has traveled. You can get a few meters with a time of flight measurement, you're doing really good in terms of temporal estimation and distance estimation. Um, so another way to do that is by just looking at path loss, because it turns out all of these low power energy sensors Almost all of them, to s can you can record the signal strength that's being measured by the chip. So if you have a little Bluetooth low energy chip or a Zigbee low energy chip or whatever that you've incorporated into your sensor node, you almost always have power in dB, usually with the granularity of one dB uh, that you can measure. So the, the measurement is in dBm and the granularity is about one dB or a half a dB depending on your equipment. And it's interesting that you, that's enough information to estimate what uh, the position of things, especially in a network like the, of the style that I've drawn here on uh, the computer. And so if we're doing some using received signal strength. Received signal strength is, is always a mixed bag because people generally consider received signal strength to be a very noisy metric, and it is, largely because of large scale fading, which adds a lot of variability. We know how to, to track that in this class. And then also small scale fading, you know, that can add at least four or five dB of standard deviation error. So I, when I was, uh, before I became a professor, I was working as a consultant with this company out in the Bay Area called Polaris Wireless. This was around 2002. Yeah, that's when I started. I did some things off and on with them until I took the job at Georgia Tech, worked with them for a few months, and come back. Because they were a startup, they just needed some expertise uh, on demand to, to solve some of their problems as they were launching a technology that could locate cell phones on the cellular network. Because at the time, we didn't have a really good solution for E911. Most of the handsets at that era did not have GPS receivers in them. And the FCC was mandating that we had to find users within 100 meters that dialed 911 with their cell phones. And, you know, the carriers had this one technique that involved time difference of arrival. It was kind of mod modeled after GPS, uh, and it didn't work. It was terrible. You know, it was expensive. You had to put $10,000 boxes on every single tower that you had, and, and it, that was kind of a disaster. And then even, even then, you, GPS is not always available. So what do you do when you don't get your GPS signal? 
is there a way to get a crude estimate? And it turns out that this guy that I was, uh, that started the company, he had done a famous video game and sold that previous company, and he's one who's looking for the next great thing to get into. So he's at a party talking to some electrical engineers that were into wireless. He says, well, are there any unsolved problems in your field? And they say, well, yeah, the E911 problem for cellular. He says, well, are there any ways that people haven't tried, have tried that, or haven't tried that might work? He says, well, there's this one technique that might work, but nobody, well, the have, people haven't tried, but nobody thinks it's gonna work. It's received signal strength fingerprinting. That is, coming up with a map of signal strength and then taking measurements from a phone, because it turns out digital phones are always monitoring the, the base stations that they can hear, right? They're always looking for the next best thing. My signal strength gets too low, I'm gonna jump over to this base station. Hence, hence that's are ruthlessly unfaithful, right? And so they're always bundling up their measurements and if requested, they can send it back to the serving base station so that the base station understands, oh yeah, this, you need to talk to this, that's this tower over here that you're talking to. You can go ahead and make the handoff. And so that's a, actually a very valuable piece of information. Here in Shenzhen, your phone would be able to record probably two dozen nearest neighbor um, base stations on various frequencies, given how densely populated we are and how ubiquitous the cell phone is in this city. And so it turns out that if you make a, a signal strength measurement and try to get location based on it, one by itself is a really crummy measurement, just like anybody would intuitively think. But if you get a lot of them together, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of these measurements together, they actually start working really, really well. And so if I were, was in this environment, and let's say I had characterized this with a path loss exponent, And let's say, so, so in that instance, my path loss from node i to j should be equal to, in the dB scale, whatever my reference path loss is, path loss at one meter free space, minus 10n log base 10 of the distance between 1 and 3, right? And of course, this reference path loss occurs at whatever reference distance I've cho chosen. When we did propagation modeling a month or so ago, we, we always chose a reference distance of 1 meter. Yeah, that's, that's the way to go. It keeps it simple, and that's the most common reference. So if I rearrange this equation, one and three, I'm getting specific all of a sudden. Let's put R, R I, J, the, the distance between the I, from the I to the J transmitter and receiver. Let me rearrange this so that I get a distance. R one three equals R naught times 10 to the P L one three minus P L naught over 10 N. So here's my reference distance. And the path loss that I measure, let's, again, I, I'm, so, I'm starting to get very specific, right? This would read an estimate of the distance between nodes one and three based on measured path loss. And this assumes that I know what the environment is, that I know what N is. I can make an estimate. Now it's gonna be a crummy estimate. I could be an order of magnitude off with this thing. But if I have a network kind of like a, of the type that I've drawn up here, then I have quite a bit of these measurements that I can make, right? Each node that I add to, to a network that already has N nodes in it, adds another n set of measurements that I can make. And so it has this way of kind of multiplying. And if that's the case, then I could write a whole bunch of these equations. I could 
get the node distance from node 3 to 2 to 3 based on the link path loss. I could do an estimate from three to four. From three to seven, and so forth and so forth. OK, so now I have all of these estimates for the distances between my nodes. How do I synthesize this into an actual xy location? Well, if I have a couple of those fixed anchor nodes, then what I can do is basically come up with a, a master expression, sort of an, I'm going to call it energy for this moment, but this is really a measure of error. That's because of a really nice analogy. So I can come up with a, a sort of a mean squared error. The total energy in the system is going to be the summation over all the nodes, all the combinations of nodes. So if I have n sensor networks, and I sum from i to j, from 1 to n each, then the physical distance so these are estimates of my position. Some of these will be anchor nodes, and they will have a fixed position. Others will be variables. If I take that, I subtract out what the path loss exponent would have been, or the path loss based measurement would have been, and I square that. You see what I've done there? I've got a whole bunch of unknowns, a set of 2D positions. Some of them are anchor nodes. Some of them are free to move because I don't know where they are. I take a magnitude of that, and I subtract that against what my path loss estimate predicts the distance would be. And really what I'm going to try to do is minimize the sum of this entire thing. Minimize, find the combinations of R and J that minimize this summation. And there's actually a beautiful analogy to what this is doing. If we go back up to our thing. It's almost as if there's a spring. There are springs with the same spring constant connected to all of these. And that, you know, just as a spring, you know, the energy of a spring is equal to the square of the degree that you've stretched or compressed it beyond its natural length. So you can think of the natural length as the estimate we've made with the path loss. And the, your node position, depending on where it is, adds energy to some springs, ten, takes energy away to some springs. So if you had a, a node that was, what was he, this green thing? Ooh, highlighting. There you go. If that green node in the middle of the screen was free to move, if we suddenly hooked all these springs to it with the spring constant that I defined there, and I let it go, in nature it would just immediately find the location that minimize the energy of the system. So all you need to do is mathematically perform that same option, or that same action. And you can do this in as large of a network as you want. You have a couple of anchor nodes, and then maybe a vast array of unknown nodes, and you optimize it in this way. You just sort of let go of everything with springs attached, so to speak, and let the whole system find the minimum energy point. And it's very easy to get about a meter accuracy that way using these types of systems, especially indoors where there's a, 
a little more variety, a little higher ex path loss exponent. High path loss exponent really helps for this type of problem. So anyway, that paper is online. That's a, a really a, a well-known paper that produced a seminal result. And then uh, the, the next step that Pat Wari took about it, I don't have the paper online for you to read about this. I'll just tell you about it, is to solve the tomography problem. He does a lot with, with like little low cost radio sensors. So in tomography, Let's say you have a bunch of sensors talking with each other. And we may have mentioned a little bit of this up earlier. Remember when we had the partition-based model, we said path loss takes the form, or, or what we called B, which was a function of path loss, is equal to some environmental matrix with a bunch of information about the environment times uh, partition matrix which had information about the types of partitions the uh, loss that you typically experience when stuff is in the way between your transmitter and your receiver and so when you're solving the problem B equals AX I like to call that the prediction problem. You're predicting path loss. When you solve the problem that you did in one of your homeworks, ATA inverse ATB, that over-constrained problem, that's called optimization. And that was tuning a model, right? Trying to figure out what are the best uh, values to, to use for partition-based losses. And then there's another problem that you can solve where, and it's actually the hardest of the three, where you know B and you know X and you're trying to guess at the structure of A. So this tends to be a perfectly constrained problem when you're doing pre prediction. This next problem, optimization, has an over-constrained problem. The tomography problem is when you're trying to figure out the environment from your measurements and information about what you know about the environment, the types of things in your environment. So this in tomography, if one one person moves through this sensor network and blocks, say, one of these links, you should see that link drop in path loss and then pop back up. And so if you have enough of these sprinkled about a home or an office, uh, the person can walk around and you can actually see kind of a blob. You can do some, some uh, YouTube videos. I think you probably even look up his name, Professor Pat Wari. He's got some videos of him and his grad students running around sensor networks. And you can actually tra track the shape of a human being, just kind of a blob shape, just measuring path loss on these types of uh, wireless sensor networks. And so the ideas work well together, right? You deploy a bunch of wireless sensor networks. You know where a couple of them are. Then the, the sensor networks locate themselves. And then once they've located themselves and calibrated, then they observe the environment and try to find people that walk around, all just measuring path loss. Very, very straightforward. Very, not straightforward, very hard, but very interesting. So that's what the paper, at least the, the background of the paper, locating the nodes is the one that uh, has been assigned reading for this. And then I thought I'd end, we'll spend the last 15 minutes talking about another interesting behavior for sensing, another application of one of the things that we're talking about is uh, malevolent object detection is the other paper that I've assigned for reading.
And this idea came about because uh, <clears throat> there's been a, a great deal of concern worldwide uh, over I, not just identity theft, but uh, financial information theft, especially at things like ATMs and cash machines. And the reason is that your, your identification card or the bank card that you've been using all these years has a magnetic stripe with your personal information on it, the information of your account and everything. It doesn't have your PIN number on it, but it has everything else that, that you need to know to make a financial transaction, grab money out of an ATM or something like that. So the problem is there's been this proliferation of people, of criminals, that put these devices called skimmers on payment terminals very easy to do. If you go on to Amazon or I guess here it would be, what is it, Baidu, or Alibaba, what is it? JD. JD. JD? Okay. You get on JD and you get uh, a little magnetic reed head for just a few pennies and kind of grind it down in your grinder at home uh, and you hook it up to some homebrewed electronics. And it's very easy to make a small almost impossible to detect skimmer that you place in or around the nose cone, uh, the, the, what they call the nose actually, of the ATM machine where you put your card in. And if any of the three stripes on your magnetic card pass over this device, all of a sudden your numbers are known to criminals. And oftentimes there's a very small camera there too that you can't even tell and it's looking at your pin number that you dial in. If you do those two things, then there's a, a special little cottage industry in Eastern Europe where they sell your numbers and your information over there. They'll make blank cards and ship them back to the United States. And then there's a professional group in the US that will go around and shop on those cards, like a little criminal industry. And so that's a really big problem. Uh, and so that, that was actually the, the problem that, that gave birth to this idea for malevolent object detection using backscatter. So here's the thing, and we understand enough in this class now to understand what, how to do it. Let's say we had something like an RFID tag, something that operated with backscatter. It could be passive, could be power assisted, could be battery assisted. Remember that the load modulation coefficient gamma sub A or B is basically the load A or B minus Z A complex conjugate over Z A or B plus Z A. These are all complex values. And so in this paper that I put online, there's this definition Oh yeah. There we go. S. Which is basically looking at the difference in return on the radio link, the complex different, which is difference, which is going to be basically proportional to Z A. Uh, gamma sub A minus gamma sub B. So be constant of proportionality that'll depend on how far apart is your reader from the tag and how far apart and what are the antenna gains and all that. But the, the, comp, the amplitude and phase are functions of the reflection coefficient. Now here's the neat thing about a backscatter link that's not true of any other type of link. If I have a reader here and let's say I have a tag on a payment terminal here. If I go and measure that link, the amplitude and the phase, and I do it right now, and then I do it one second later, is it going to change? No. You can't say that about regular wireless ch channels, right? Because the amplitude, the, the phases are changing. As long as the environment doesn't change, the phase will not change on a backscatter system. 
unlike a regular wireless link. It doesn't matter actually if you have one second, if you wait 10 seconds. In theory, if you, you can come back two years from now and you turn everything on, all the electronics on, you get the exact amplitude and the phase, as long as nothing has changed. And of course, there can be temporal variations. You know, if stuff comes in the channel, moves around like that in the link, you'll see uh, a temporal change. But the, it should always return to the baseline unless you physically change the separation distance or you know, orientation or add some material. And so one of the ways that uh, back at Georgia Tech, some student researchers came up with for solving this problem is to use a backscatter system in the nose cone, put a sensor in the nose cone of an ATM machine. And so what, what does that do? Well, one of the things that makes skimmers very hard to do is because you're, you're just trying to sense a tiny thin wire and a little reed head, some foreign electronics on this machine. And there are some experts that can walk up and even just looking at the, the, the nose, they can't tell that that device is there. Now, they've tried in the past some low frequency capacitive type of sensing, but that causes some problems too. First of all, capacitive sensing, there's always ways you can orient wires, for example, and sort of defeat the capacitive sensing. Thin wires you have trouble so detecting anyway in a capacitive system. The other thing is you get a lot of false positive. If you have an outdoor cash machine and a bunch of raindrops rain down and splatter onto your ATM, well now you've got these dielectric spheres in the vicinity and that causes false alarms at your capacitive uh, sensor. So if you use a microwave backscatter system, however, once you get a small thin wire anywhere within about a wavelength of that tag, what happens is that you provide a distortion of one S, this difference be between uh, state A and state B. So to illustrate, Okay, here's my baseline. Call it baseline measurement. Now, what happens when you bring an object close to the antenna? Which of these things in here are you actually changing? So you're not changing the load. The load modulation is the same. You're still switching between A and B, but you will change the reflection coefficient and this value S. How is that? Well, as you bring the piece of wire closer, it'll start to couple with the antenna. It'll change the radiation pattern, which will cause a change. But even more importantly, it will change the impedance of the antenna. It'll take a 50 ohm antenna and make it look like 30 plus J20 or something similar to that. It depends on what kind of resonance you create it's very sensitive to distance. So different distances create different shifts. And so if somebody goes up and places a piece of electronics, but the amplitude and the phase changes in your Z sub A term here, which propagates to the S value here. And what's more, this is persistent. Things can come and, come and go. Uh, if you put a, a reader inside an ATM machine, for example, people will walk up and get their hands near the, the um, nose of the ATM. There'll be stuff spooling around inside sometimes, like the little print spooler sticking out, you know, that one that prints out your receipt or counts the money. Those things will be moving, but when those things stop moving, you know, it always should return to their baseline, but instead it'll always return to this new baseline. So now there's this persistence issue where you've, you've got a new baseline. So if you've recorded the old baseline and looked at the difference between the two, you realize, hey, wait a second, somebody has done something. 
maybe they've taken a piece of chewing gum and pushed it up, pushed it up there. But I, I should at least sound a, an alarm to make sure that somebody comes out and checks that machine for tampering. And what's neat is that because this is basically a backscatter system, you can make RFID tags that are embedded into the nose cone of the, or the nose, they keep calling it the nose cone, like it was a rocket, it's like we're back in Zatcom class again. You put it in the nose of the ATM, you can even put them at different polarizations, you can put more than one, and in doing so you have this sort of foolproof method for um, sensing whether there has been some tampering, electronic tampering in particular, of these, uh, of these devices. So, the sensing, the actual sensing for this thing, I have the expressions here. So the paper talks about a normalized symbol distance. And because the constellation may have flipped 180 degrees, the one in the paper uses this metric. The distance, whatever the minimum distance is between your initial state, which is S, and your disturbed state. So S squiggle is your baseline, and S prime is your measurement. And you normalize this against the magnitude of your baseline. So this gives you a, a nice metric for figuring out how disturbed, what the percent disturbance, so to speak, on an IQ diagram of the return coming back. The neat thing about this, you also uh, encode information on this, right? The paper that I put online, the students were just looking at a square wave returning from their um, a sensing device. You can also put authentication information in there, or a unique identifier to make sure nobody's tampered with tags or anything. Not that, that would get you anywhere, but be another level of authentication. And uh, one of my favorite all time, probably the best senior design team that I ever had at Georgia Tech, uh, built a system like this that uh, was able to do they called themselves the Hope Diamond Team. Was a, they built a security system for a museum based on this idea where they had a microwave transceiver, and in this case they put it above the ceiling so you couldn't see it. They even built like a fake ceiling so that you couldn't see it. And then they had a table, and they had this fake diamond. It was cute. A lot of showmanship. They also put a T there because at Georgia Tech it's a tradition to steal the T. Do you know about this? Things you don't experience or care about when you're a grad student in Shenzhen. And so you cannot see anything here, but there's a little RF tag, reflector tag, under the diamond. There's a wave going down and a wave coming back up to the reader. It measures magnitude S, or actually uh, D, which is the expression I put on the previous slide. And sure enough, if you pull, if you went and took the T or you took the diamond off of the pedestal, you could see the change in the you know, they'd have this computer screen with red lights coming on and, I don't know, police flashes and that sort of thing. We were into some showmanship, right? So the interesting thing is, I have to ask this, what limits your range on this? Well, 
is there a limit in the range that you can work with would ultimately limit your system. Probably signal to noise ratio, right? If you have an IQ, di if you're measuring things on an IQ diagram, then naturally there's going to be, if you just let the thing run without a signal, there's going to be some sort of locus of points in the middle that represent all the noise. And if you don't have enough signal to noise ratio, it's harder to measure that baseline. If you get farther and farther away, then the signal to noise ratio degrades. However, other than that, it actually doesn't matter how far away your reader is to make this measurement, right? You could actually have had this sensor in the ATM or under the diamond or whatever you were trying to protect and it could be across the street over there or up on one of those high rises with a little directional antenna and you would be able to tell exactly what had happened in that vicinity, whether there had been tampering or a, a displacement. So anyway, I thought this was kind of a fun and, and very interesting case study in how to use a lot of the weird properties of these low-powered radios and sensors in a real-life system. Do you have any questions about this? No? Perfect understanding. As always, this is a smart class. Okay, with that, I'm going to finish. And